Good morning and welcome to our program. My name is Thorin Tritter. I am the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center of Nassau County, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. Before I start today's Curator's Corner, I want to mention two things that I've been mentioning in most of my Curator's Corner. Uh, one is that our building is open. So if you are inspired by this program or some of our other ones, I hope you will come to Glen Cove, come and see the objects and images that I've been talking about in my Curator's Corner in person in our museum. And secondly, of course, if you have questions during my presentation, please use the Q&A window, type in your question, and I will do what I can to respond either while I'm presenting or at the end of my talk, for sure. Okay, today, I wanna talk about this photograph that stands in our second gallery in which we use to describe the Anschluss, the so-called German annexation of Austria that took place on March 12th, 1938, 84 years ago, this coming Saturday. We in the museum explore the Anschluss in a gallery right at a point where the gallery has a big turn. And that is a physical layout that connects to our approach, which is that the, the Anschluss was one of a couple of significant turning points in 1938, that at least in hindsight, we can see were uh, important to paving the way for the way the Holocaust happened. At the time, maybe we didn't notice it. But today, looking back, we can see the Anschluss was one of these turning points. Here's the caption that we include in the museum so-called Aryan Austrians are shown welcoming Germany, uh, welcome Germany and celebrate the inclusion into the greater German Reich. Violence against Jews becomes common in the streets in Vienna. The caption highlights a couple of key points that I'd like to explore a bit more in depth. First, let me back up and just remind you that Hitler was named Germany's chancellor by President Hindenburg following a process that was laid out in the Weimar Constitution on January 30th, 1933. Hitler immediately began to consolidate his power. And when President Hindenburg died the following August, Hitler merged the offices of the president and the chancellor naming himself the Fuhrer, the leader of Germany. Between 1933 and 1939, when the war broke out, the Nazis enacted over 400 laws to define, segregate, and impoverish German Jews. They started with laws directed against state employees, but quickly broadened outward, and over a span of six years, made it legal to deport Jews and confiscate their property. The point by mentioning this is just to say that these laws were not passed secretly. They were passed so that everybody knew them, what was going on. Everyone in Germany, including foreign correspondents and members of the Foreign Diplomatic Corps, were all well aware of the growing legal segregation of Jews in Germany. For Germans, the gradual process taking six years combined with the Nazi propaganda and intimidation meant that most did not raise any opposition to the passage of these laws. American journalists and diplomats, on the other hand, were increasingly concerned about the changes they saw taking place in Germany. In January of 1934, George Messersmith, America's, America's Consul General in Berlin, wrote, there has been nothing in social history more implacable, more heartless, and more devastating than the present policy in Germany against the Jews. Now, this was coming from a guy representing the United States where Jim Crow laws legally treated African Americans as second class citizens in much of the United States. So that's a pretty powerful statement to make about what was taking place in Germany. But anti Semitism, regardless of the fact that Messersmith could draw attention to it, was less of a concern to the leaders of other countries outside of Germany than the fear that Germany was going to start another war. And in 1938, Hitler used that fear to enable him to go forward with the Anschluss. The idea of the Anschluss, the idea of a unified Germany and Austria went much further back than, 19, than the 1930s, uh, at least back to 1871, 
when Germany and Prussia had come together and left Austria out of the mix. Germany and Austria, Hungary had been uh, allies during World War I, establishing a strong connection and fighting alongside each other during that war. So that raised the idea again of some kind of merger between Germany and Austria. But after World War I, when Germany and Austria-Hungary were defeated, the Versailles Treaty blocked any possible unification, even as there remained much support for the idea both in Germany and in Austria, and of course, most notably, with Adolf Hitler. In 1938, despite Hitler's calls for Austria to become part of the German Reich, the Austrian Chancellor Kurt Schuschnigg was one of the most vocal voices that opposed such a, mer such a merger. In an effort to counter Hitler, Schuschnigg announced that there would be a plebiscite on March 13, 1938, to give Austrians a chance to vote on whether Germany and Austria should be combined. Hitler quickly denounced the plebiscite, unwilling to let a popular vote decide his policy. And he then privately reached out to Schuschnigg, threatened an invasion unless the plebiscite was called off. Schuschnigg relented, was forced to resign on March 11, 1938, and the next day, March 12, 84 years ago this coming Saturday, German troops entered Austria, and one day later, Austria was formally incorporated into Germany. Our photo captures some of that public response as German troops marched into Austria. And here, let me talk for a minute about the word Anschluss, a German word that means connection or joining that is also used to refer to the events of March 12, 1938. In English, we use the word annexation, a word that means, I put it up here, the unilateral action by one state to proclaim sovereignty over a territory previously outside of its domain. I suppose that that definition does describe what happened in March of 1938. But to me, there's another connotation of annexation, which, uh, so, which doesn't include the welcoming reception and eager embrace of the larger Austrian population. Annexation to me suggests a takeover against the will of the local people, but that was not the case in Austria in 1938. As our photograph shows, many in Austria welcomed the merger with Germany. Using the word annexation, at least in my mind, also feels uh, like it's part of the argument made by Austrians after the war that the Austrians had been forced to accept German rule and were, as they described it, Hitler's first victims. That phrase, Hitler's first victims, became one of the Austrians, one that the Austrians turned to in order to claim that they were not responsible for the treatment and murder of Jews in Austria. They emphasized they were victims of Nazism too, and that the Holocaust was something perpetrated by Germans, not Austrians. That image, of course, uh, the image that you see here, of course, is an academic journal from, 20, uh, from 2003 that focused on the use of that label by Austrians in the post-war period. The view that Austrians were the first victims was sustained into the 1980s. In 1978, for example, the first Austrian national exhibition was opened at the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum. You see here the entrance to the exhibit. The title of the exhibition, which was shown, you can see here in German and Polish, translates to Austria, first victim of national socialism. That exhibition was eventually closed and more, a more historically accurate one has now opened. But the fact that even in 1978, the Austrian government could promote the argument in an exhibit in Auschwitz that they were their first victims, I think says a lot. The issue came to a head in 1986, when Kurt Waldheim, a former intelligence officer in the Wehrmacht, won the presidency in Austria. West German, American, and other journalists accused Waldheim of being a member of a Nazi organization, but he denied the accusations and insisted that such attacks were both defaming to him and defaming to a whole generation of Austrians. The issue perhaps most clearly got explained 
by the president of the World Jewish Congress, Edgar Bronfman, in a powerfully worded op-ed that was published in the New York Times in February of 1988. I would like to suggest Edgar Bronfman, wrote, Edgar Bronfman wrote, that the world is not so much concerned with Mr. Waldheim as it is with the wartime atrocities committed by the Nazis. The world is further concerned with the fact that Austria, once declared the first victim of Nazism, was indeed more than a willing partner in the Anschluss and played a comparably sordid role in the Holocaust. Bronfman continued, most of Austria has been living a lie since the end of World War II. For political reasons related to the Cold War, the victorious allies declared Austria a victim, not a perpetrator. Kurt Waldheim is the symbol of that lie. The real issue is that Austria has lied for decades about its involvement in the very atrocities Kurt Waldheim was involved in, deportations, reprisal murders, and other atrocities too painful to think about. Although Waldheim continued to serve as president until 1992, his tenure as president brought such attention to the actions of Austria during World War II that finally the nation was forced to confront its active support of Nazi policies. Still, we continue to use the word annexation to describe that merger between Germany and Austria in 1938, which at least for me is problematic. It belies the active support of Austrians. Let me share a diary entry, which offers another view of the public support Nazi troops and Hitler received in Austria in 1938. Two Americans, Helen and Ross Baker, were living in Vienna when Hitler arrived in the Austrian capital. And I wanna draw from Helen's diary. Helen writes that on March 14th, they heard Hitler was going to arrive in the afternoon in Vienna. She notes flags all over town, even on our house, but not in the apartment below where a Jewish doctor lives. Helen Ross hurried down and managed to get a spot to watch in front of the parliament in Austria, in Vienna. But after almost four hours, they heard Hitler was too tired and was not gonna arrive that day. On the next day, Tuesday, Helen and Ross headed back to the central square in front of the parliament building. And she writes, the Fuhrer due to speak at 11 in Heldenplatz, we went and hope we could, we got some good pictures of the saluting crowds as well of him uh, at his hotel. They, the crowd yelled until he came out onto the balcony. Dear leader, be so kind, show yourself on the windowsill, although in German it rhymes. Meanwhile, troops had arrived and tanks and machine guns, etc. They filled the streets and no cars were running. That's what she writes, army of occupation. Here's a view uh, that gives you a sense of some of the crowd that Helen and Ross were part of. I mean, it's just massive. The size and the response of the cheering crowd to me highlights that many Austrians favored the merger with Germany and that it wasn't really an annexation. For Jews in Austria, the public support for Hitler was nothing short of terrifying. They had watched from what they thought was a safe distance as the Nazis had restricted the rights of Jews in Germany gradually over five years, turning citizens into hated others. In Austria, the same, the same process would take place overnight as the Nazis immediately imposed all the restrictions on Jews that they had gradually developed in Germany. Let me show a short clip from the testimony of Anita Weiss Weissbord, a survivor who lives here in Nassau County and has worked with the Holocaust Memorial for many years. She was born on March 1st, 1923, as the youngest of three children to an upper middle-class Jewish family living in Vienna. In March of 1938, she had just turned 15. She picks up the story there. March the 13, 1938, Hitler marched into Austria. I remember that day vividly. They were marching on the street. They had all the swastika flags, the armbands with the swastika ready. They were marching on the street and chanting, Hitler awake, Jude awake. That means Hitler awake, Jews perish. That was the end of my childhood, the way I knew it. 
So that is a, oh, sorry. One other response I think is noteworthy to the Anschluss. And that is really the lack of a response that came from foreign powers. Despite the fact that the Anschluss broke a provision in the Versailles Treaty, France offered no formal response and England's prime minister, Neville Chamberlain, largely threw up his hands and said, without military force, nothing could have stopped Germany. I, I don't wanna to compare too many things from the past to the present, but there does seem to be a case where unless there's military force, it's pretty hard to stop opposition to an invasion. Um, Hitler saw in 1938 that despite the harsh restrictions of the Versailles Treaty, there was not going to be, um, if, if no response came to his invasion of the Anschluss, then that enabled him to see that other military expansions, other mil uh, territorial expansions could also be taken. And he followed up with the annexation of the Sudetenland a little later on in 1938. And of course, the invasion of Poland in September of 1939. So that's a little background, maybe more than you wanted, about the photo that we have in our gallery. But let me talk a bit more about a couple of things that are particularly in this photo. One of the striking parts of this image, I think, and one of the things that kind of you see first off when you look at it, is that it shows a huge line of girls, a huge crowd of girls, only girls, going down the street. And although it might not be initially clear, a close look shows that they are all wearing the same uniform, the same pocketed skirt, the same socks and shoes. Most are also wearing the same double-breasted jacket on top of a white blouse. They are members, oops, sorry, they are members of the Bund Deutsche Mädel abbreviated as the BDM. The name literally translates to the Band of German Maidens, but in English, it's often referred to as the League of German Girls. This was the girls' wing of the Nazi party youth movement called the Hitler Youth, shown here in a Nazi rally in Nuremberg in 1934. The origins of the Hitler Youth go back actually to 1922 when the young Nazi party, already under the leadership of, the, uh, of Adolf Hitler, established a youth organization to help train and recruit <coughs> uh, future stormtroopers, future SA or brown shirts. Initially, the group was only for boys. And of course, no Jews were allowed to join. But five years later, in 1927, the Sisterhood of the Hitler Youth was established, eventually evolving into the League of German Girls, which was formally founded in 1930. Excuse me. <clears throat> Both the boys and the girls had specific uniforms to encourage unity of appearance and thought. For the boys, it was a black set of shorts, a brown shirt, and a black kerchief. For the girls, a blue skirt, a white blouse, and the same black kerchief, and a brown jacket. When the Nazis came to power in January of 1933, the Hitler Youth Movement had about 100,000 members. By the end of that same year, early 1934, membership had soared to 2 million, around 30% of all German youth between the ages of 10 and 18. <coughs> That's already by 1934. As Nazi control grew, they forced the closing of other, the Nazis forced the closing of other youth organizations and pressured people to join the Hitler Youth. In 1936, the Nazis passed a law that made participation mandatory for all ethnic Germans and German citizens, as long as they could prove that they were free of hereditary diseases. <coughs> By 1937, the Hitler Youth included 5.4 million members, about 65% of all German children. And by 1940, over 7 million members, about 82% of German children between the ages of 10 and 18. The fact that the figure was not 90% or 99 or 100% suggests there was some resistance among a small percentage of Germans who managed to keep their children out of the Hitler Youth. But overall, there was wide scale involvement by German families. But the Hitler Youth and the BDM did not only exist in Germany. As our photograph makes clear, 
There were also organizations and wings of the youth organizations in other countries like Austria. In fact, here's a photo of ethnic Germans living in China who were members of the Hitler Youth and the League of German Girls. And one from right here on Long Island. Note the same uniform is in use on Long Island as it was in Germany or Austria. The League of German Girls initially consisted of two sections, the Young Girls League for girls 10 to 14, the League proper for girls 14 to 18. And then in 1938, an additional layer was added, another group that was called the Faith and Beauty Society, which was for those ages 17 to 21. I think the name itself, the Faith and Beauty Society, draws our attention to the highly gendered view that was promoted in, uh, by the Nazis in Germany, a, ger a gendered view of society. Activities for boys in the Hitler Youth focused initially on hiking, camping, and sports, but by the late 1930s included military style training, including weapons training. And for the girls, there was also physical exercise, but that was combined with training to prepare them for their roles in German society as wives, mothers and homemakers. They even received lectures on the need to produce many children. For both boys and girls, a strong emphasis was placed on self-sacrifice and the importance of doing what was in the interest of Germany, including encouraging children to potentially rebel against their parents if their parents were not following the needs of national socialism. The girls in this photograph had certainly been taught for a number of years about Hitler's greatness and how his plans were creating a resurgence for Germany and would be a good thing for Austria. One other thing about this photograph that strikes me is a kind of contradiction in it. On the one hand, the image shows smiling faces and the unabashed happiness of youth and these young girls who are clearly very happy to be celebrating the arrival of the Nazis and the merger of Germany and Austria. On the other hand, I have in my mind the ideology that these girls are so pleased by, an ideology that celebrated hate and encouraged these girls to actively support racism and prejudice. You know, if you took out the swastikas, and if you didn't know that these girls were members of the Hitler Youth, they probably wouldn't appear very differently than the children who line the sides of American streets during parade days here. But what's so disturbing is that their smiling faces are cheering the arrival of the Nazis, whose laws took away the citizenship of Austrian Jews, forced Jews from their homes, enabled the government to close businesses and steal their possessions, and eventually paved the way for the mass murder of 60,000 Austrian Jews. So as we come to the anniversary of the Anschluss this Saturday, I hope this image reminds us all how easy it is to teach hatred and racism and the need to continually combat those ideas. HMTC's mission is to use the history of the Holocaust and its lessons to promote resistance to prejudice and to advocate respect for every human being. I hope that's what I've conveyed today. Okay, I will stop there. Thank you for watching. I see there's a couple of questions. If you others have others, please type them in. Let me put in a plug about some upcoming programs. Next Tuesday, March 15th, in honor of Women's History Month, HMTC's David Taub Real Upstander film series will pre present a virtual screening of The Code Breaker, the American Experience documentary about Elizabeth Smith Friedman, who was one of the leading code breakers and cryptologists during World War I and World War II here in America. To lead us into that screening and to answer questions, we will be joined by Melissa Davis, the Library and Archives Director of the George C. Marshall Foundation, which holds the papers of Elizabeth Smith Friedman. Then on Monday, March 12th, we're offering a sneak peek at some of the content that will be included in the upcoming exciting concert at Carnegie Hurt Hall that we are organizing on April 20th. Join us on March 21st to learn about the connections between the pieces of music they're gonna, gonna be, that will be performed, including details about Michelle Lassale's Auschwitz symphonic poem that was written in 1948, but has never been performed and will, re will receive its first world premiere 
at Carnegie Hall on April 20th. You can find out how to buy tickets to that performance on our website. And one more program to mention, <clears throat> Thursday, March 24th, we have a program with award-winning author Meg Waite Clayton, who will be talking about her book, The Last Train to London, and about the kinder transport, which her book describes, which saved the lives of 10,000 uh, Jewish children. You can find more details about all these programs and our full calendar of events on our website at www.hmtcli.org, and then click on the events tab. I also always hope that you will go to our website, click the Give Now button, and make a donation to sponsor and support our program. Okay, let me see. I see some, uh, some questions here. Let me see if I can respond. How did Austrians vote in the referendum for the Anschluss outside of Austria? Um, I don't know uh, what the, first of all, there was no referendum, no plebiscite held on, uh, on March, th March 13th as originally planned, it was canceled. There was a later one held after the Nazis had, um, had taken over and after they had already said that the, the two countries were merged, Jews were not allowed to vote in that, nor Roma and Sinti and over 99% of people uh, apparently voted in favor of it, although, um, Kind of questionable uh, data for that. I don't know in particular how Austrians outside of Austria voted though, I'm sorry. Uh, how popular was the idea of annexation before Hitler invaded? You know, there was no, I, I don't know of any popular uh, polls that were done. There certainly was a lot of support, but Schuschnigg was the, the voice and as, the, as the, uh, the prime minister or president, he was the one who was kind of controlling the narrative in Austria. He was against it. What resistance by Austrians was there after the Anschluss? Yeah, there certainly were Austrians who helped Jews. Uh, there, were, there was resistance that operated. The original exhibit that was opened at the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum had a whole section about Auschwitz, uh, Austrian resistance to the Nazis. So it certainly was, it did happen, but, um, but that's not the only part of the story. Uh, does to what degree has Austria today taken responsibility for their role in the, host in the Holocaust? I think Austria has come a long way since 1986. Uh, there, there was memorial. There are memorials now to the Holocaust, which only came up, uh, only were erected after 1986. Uh, they had a, a commission of historians who accepted uh, or you know confirmed Austrian involvement. So I, I think um, as a government. As a state, there is recognition of their involvement today in a way that's completely different from what the case was even 30 years ago. Uh, did you mention the book group on Wednesday? Uh, Linda, uh, we have a book group in case some of you don't know it. Uh, and we are reading actually this, this week uh, or this month. We're meeting on March 16th for our book group meeting and we're reading The Last Train to London. So. Um, Megway Clayton is coming and doing a presentation after that book group meeting. But if you're interested in our book group, please take a look on our website. We have a, a monthly book group and I encourage all to join if you're interested. Uh, let me see here. I see some other questions, I think here. Uh, oh, okay, maybe not. Uh, so thanks very much for joining and I wish you all a, a pleasant day and hope to see you at some of our other programs soon. Take care everybody.